my shout out today goes to Joe and Jane. You can see them here. I guess they found out that we have reserved the venue for 2020 Infotex Jam and they wanted to camp out for it. Somebody really needs to let them know that the jam isn't until July of 2020. I, I really don't think they need to be camping out this hey, far Dan. in advance. Dan, you do realize that Joe and Jane are cartoon characters, what? right? Are you sure? I mean, just so you know, Mike, uh, these are my guitars. Actually, that's my friend Al's guitar. Uh, but that's my, uh, this right here is my acoustic bass. Uh, you know, this is my 12 string. That's my um, Taylor. I, I'm really proud of that guitar. It's a cartoon with a picture of your guitar. All right. It. Well, okay. Well, good to know. Coming to a theater in Lafayette, Indiana on July 24th, 2020. The Infotex Jam. Only mark your calendars if you like having fun. Email us to register. Everybody is welcome. Our lawyers want you to know that when you attend any of our webinars or watch any of our movies, you're agreeing to the terms of service located at the link on the screen. We're also required to provide this abbreviation of what our terms of service include. The main point we need to get across is that regulations change on a regular basis, and we want you to know that what we present can sometimes be very time-dated information or our own interpretation of new guidance or regulations. The materials we present today are subject to change. Also, whenever we provide free boilerplates as part of our webinars or movies, we're required to point out our transfer of copyright agreement, which is also located on our website, in our IT resources library. You can read it by going to the link on the screen. Please also note, by attending an Infotex webinar or by receiving any Infotex movie, you may be added to our mailing list. We apologize if you'd rather not receive notice of other free education. You can always opt out at the link on the screen. And one last thing before we introduce our moderator, Michael Hartke. We'll be initiating a survey directly after the webinar, and we ask you to take a minute to fill it out. We would really appreciate it. And now, it is our pleasure to introduce to you our webinar moderator. The code curator and special envoy from the seam, Michael Hardke. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Hardke. I'm the curator of code here at Infotex and your moderator. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them as you see pictured here. We will make sure they get answered. We'd like to point out destinations on our website, webinars.infotex.com, where you can find our upcoming webinar topics and event schedule, and then also movies.infotex.com, where you can find the movies of these webinars and training videos. Today's webinar is a new format based on feedback from our clients. We call this new format the Webinar Short, where Dan has been challenged to keep the webinar to 20 minutes or less. Today's webinar short is about diagramming using PowerPoint instead of Visio or one of the many online data flow diagramming tools as the medium. PowerPoint gives us many advantages, including the fact that we can remember the flow a year or two after we diagrammed it. Dan will show us how we can do this by diagramming a typical mortgage loan process using, you guessed it, PowerPoint. How about now then? Am I in a cartoon now? No, Dan, you're a live video. So, okay, so this is a live video. Okay, um, where am I? Is it? Oh, okay. Diagramming. A more. Okay, yeah. Now I now I figured it out. Okay, I'm going to talk about diagramming a mortgage process. And by the way, I'm I'm going to talk about using PowerPoint as a diagramming tool. And I know that that might be. A little bit, you know, kind of like what-ish. So anyway, this is the this is the guidance, right? 
that required us all to do data flow diagrams. And uh, it kind of left us all in a position, in my opinion, uh, where we were trying to decide what do we use to do our diagramming. And I've seen a lot of our clients start off using Visio and then they just kind of throw that away. And uh, I have actually seen some people use Excel. Can you believe that? Um, as their diagramming tool. I use PowerPoint. I find PowerPoint is the application I, I live in. And so I've kind of gotten good at creating process diagrams using PowerPoint. But uh, we also found uh, Total Recall as an app for the iPhone. Uh, and then Sketchboard.me, LucidChart. There's several web apps out there that we can use for data flow diagramming. Now, having said that, I have to admit that, that these uh, right here, the, uh, the giant sticky note and the Sharpies and some whiteout um, is quite frankly a very good diagramming tool as well. Um, but let me just kind of remind people, if you've been watching my webinars or my workshops over the years, um, you're used to seeing process diagrams like this where um, you know, an, an IT risk analysis process, you know, starts with a risk management team and then you've probably seen me walk through this and explain what each step of these processes are. You know, I have the ability to kind of make that red arrow flashing a little bit there to, you know, to dwell on the fact that the risk determination meeting needs to be held with the risk management team and that, you know, they're going to agree on certain things and then the process continues and as you can see, See, it's kind of nice because I'm able to explain the process many years after I've drawn this diagram um, to help people understand what I mean about a risk analysis, at least the way it was conducted back when I created this process diagram. Um, I also have a process diagram for vendor management as well. And, and in this case, I'm like, hey, it starts with the vendor management policy, dude. And then from there, we go to a threshold analysis where we sort our vendors. There's kind of a due diligence request. And, and, and then again, I'm able to kind of go back and forth with this just by you know, moving this anima animation forward and backwards a little bit, right? And then, you know, I finished the process drawing and everybody understands how the risk assessment process works, at least as it was drawn when I, I drew it here. And, and years later, I'm able to go back, by the way, and show how this works. And so um, I've kind of taken to teaching people there's a five question process for creating your data flow diagrams. Because by the way, what you just saw me walk through there, those are process diagrams, right? Not data flow diagrams. And so really, if you look at this, A, is there gonna be, you know, this, this is a process diagram. What's nice about processes is that they're not as unlimited or as detailed, right, as data flow diagrams. In my five question process, I basically start off by asking, before we get started drawing this drawing, who are the players? And, and so at the highest level, if we was to basically just say, hey, how does data flow in and out of the bank and who uses it, et cetera, et cetera. At the highest level, we could say, these are the players. We have users, we have the bank, we have the bank's customers, we have uh, service providers. And, and yes, I am using piggy banks for the service providers, at least in this drawing. And, and I'll have to admit the reason why is because I'm hoping that you'll have a good feeling about service providers. And I know how bankers like piggy banks it. No, just kidding you. Um, that was just what I grabbed. I left it in there on purpose to bring up a point that what the team needs to decide during the early parts of the data flow diagramming process is what conventions are we gonna use. And so we've already decided we don't have to use normal data flow diagramming conventions because if we do, then nobody, not even the technical people without using Google, understand the diagram once it's done. All right, so we want to use iconography in our diagrams that everybody understands. I just happen to choose a piggy bank for the service providers. Um, but then, you know, we can add in some arrows showing where the data goes. And so in this case, I'm basically saying that users work at the bank and uh, customers interact with the bank. Um, they actually, you know, interact with the bank a lot over the internet now, or, you know, what this diagram is calling the cloud. Um, and then the service providers also are working through the internet to interact with our customers and our users at the bank. And by the way, the threats are always there. And they're, they're threatening the bank, but they're also, you know, threatening our customers. 
and are threatening our service providers. And so there we go. Uh, we have a very high level diagram that illustrates where data goes in and out of the bank. And, you know, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could say, okay, this is our board data flow diagram. And I encourage you to take a picture of this or a print screen or whatever and use this. Um, if your board is at the point where you're still trying to help them understand the very basics of how information flows through the bank. But the point I'm making is that we've also identified who is going to be the players in almost every single data flow diagram that we draw. You know, there's the bank, there's our users, there's our customers, there's threats, there's our service providers and other third parties that may be involved in the process. And so um, what I would like to do now is, and by the way, it says giant sticky note number four at the top. I'm not going to show you the giant sticky note I made this and based this on, but suffice it to say that I did do a drawing on a sketch pad before I actually got started drawing it out in PowerPoint. And so the giant sticky note thing might be where we start. And so question number one would be, hey, let's write out on this giant sticky note all of the players that are going to be involved in the uh, process. And so it could be just a matter of getting on our giant sticky note the players. Um, I've done this in PowerPoint, so A, I can present this in a webinar format. B, so I also can show you one of the advantages of using PowerPoint in order to go through the five question process that I'm going to be illustrating here. We also need to make sure that we're, um, again, developing our own data flow diagramming conventions. And so we might say that this, this, this right here is a web interface. It's what a web interface looks like. Uh, these ovals are our providers. The, the cylinder, maybe that's a database or whatever. But, but we agree upon what our iconography is going to be. You know, the, the unopened letter could be an email, you know, that sort of thing, right? Um, and I also wanted to let you know that I started this particular data flow diagram at 12.30 p.m. Uh, because I was going to show you how quickly you can get this done. Um, next, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of reduce the size of everything and um, then move into my second question, which is what assets, what business processes are involved? Well, we already decided that we wanted to draw the mortgage uh, processing at a particular bank. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and give the name up there on the left. And, and you know, I mean, I also know that secure mail is going to be involved. The Internet's going to be involved. Uh, you know, there's going to be service providers. And, of course, the threats. The threats are always there, right? Um, but then I also happen to know that there's five vendors. Um, again, I got this little, you know, diagram I grew on, drew on a side, giant sticky note number four. Uh, but there's five different vendors, so I've created five ovals, as you can tell in this part of the process. I just created five ovals to represent the five vendors. I'm not saying that I'm actually identifying those vendors yet, uh, but I'm, I, get, I get the rest of the players on the screen. But then I'm also going to start putting in some of the paper. Uh, and, and with this bank, we decided that we could use this document symbol to represent paper documents. Um, we've got three different web interfaces that are going to be involved. Uh, five different human beings are actually printing stuff out. Um, but then they're also scanning it back in. You know, and I'm just kind of making sure I have everything there. I've got all the players now. I know that the core is going to be involved. It's, I, I don't recall seeing a data flow diagram where the core wasn't involved. And unless it's a high-level diagram or, you know, secure messaging or whatever. Um, and then finally, you know, we have a, a middleware server and an imaging server that's involved in the process as well. Um, I decided that we don't really need to show the bank or we don't need to show users because we're getting very granular on that. Um, and, uh, you know, I decided to use ovals instead of a piggy bank for the service providers. So, uh, you know, we can start off with one icon and decide we don't like it anymore down the road. Then, where is the data coming from? And so, you know, I, now I'm starting to organize the drawing to say, hey, you know, it, it originally, you know, starts with our customers, of course, but then it goes through our users and our loan processors, you know, underwriters. In this bank's case, the underwriters worked in a different company. Um, I'm using green for the people that work at the bank and black for the people that don't. Then, of course, I use 
people bringing money into a big building for our customers. Um, and then there's our printed documents. Got to have printed documents if we're going to be working in a bank. So we've got the loan application itself. Can't really blame the, blank, the bank for using a paper document for your loan application. We need something that the customers can write their information on. Um, and then, of course, the approved loan itself is also a printed document that the customers need to sign. Uh, we have all the different web interfaces that the data is going to move through. We've got the printers, which is where the data is going to. We've got the scanner, which is, you know, used to get, you know, what we've already printed out, scanned into the system. The core and the title company are involved. We've got the middleware server and that sort of thing, uh, secure messaging. Um, then we want to find out, you know, where does the data go? How does it get there? And so that's when we start drawing in our lines, right? And so what I wanted to finish with then is the reason why I'm suggesting you consider doing a data flow diagram in PowerPoint. And the reason why is because what we've learned is this right here is a pretty decent mortgage process data flow diagram um, that we all learned how to read as we invented the iconography and as we drew the lines, we also learned where the data is growing, you know, going and that sort of thing, right? But here's the rub, and um, the rub is kind of hard, and that is a year later when the auditors come in and they say, all right, well, this is a great diagram, but can you explain to me how this works? Because it's not using data flow diagramming conventions, and even though as an auditor, I don't know, even know how to read data flow diagramming conventions. I learned it in college, and that's the last time I had to use it, and so, you know, but because it's not using any kind of conventions, someone needs to explain to me what the drawing means. And so the problem is, is what we're finding at least, is that our, our clients are usually all going like this. The first step is they scratch their head as they're looking at it. And then the second step is they say, well, I don't know, we drew this a year ago, which is true. And, and so what I like about PowerPoint is it answers the last question, which is when are we regrouping for the second iteration? And, and the reason why it answers that question is because it makes it easy for us to say, well, hey, a year from now, let's get out our PowerPoint and we'll start all over again, but we'll start with where we left off last year, which is we can animate the PowerPoint to help us understand what we learned last year. And so A, the threats are always there, right? So we're starting off with that. But then we have customers that come into the bank, they interact with our users, our loan officers, our lenders, and they ultimately they fill out a loan application that the lender then prints out and basically then sends to loan processors who are also printing out whatever they need to print as they process the loan. Um, they will then communicate back and forth with our customers uh, using secure email, um, and then ultimately they will use a web interface to get into the loan origination application where they're scanning what they already printed out back into the system, and then via the internet, it's going out to five different vendors. Each of these vendors is getting customer information, and therefore they're all listed in our vendor due diligence program in a manner to where we are in compliance with whatever guidance governs our particular bank on vendor management. And of course, the threats are always there. Uh, they're not only trying to attack us, but they're also trying to attack our customers and our vendors through the internet. Um, then, once we've started the process, underwriters who in the case of this bank are working for a third party and also printing stuff out, um, they're working the loan um, until they've received an approved, you know, loan and then they work with the title company uh, who's also by the way communicating back with everybody else via the web interfaces that we've you know already kind of established um, and then of course the title company and probably the underwriters as well if they have any questions would be using secure messaging to work with our uh, customers um, and you know lenders and uh, you know closers loan closers um, who are using printers as well. Um, and then via the loan origination application, you know, again, it's going out to the internet and, you know, inter interacting with, you know, all the various players that are in the data flow diagram so far. Uh, the closers then will, uh, through a middleware server, make sure the appropriate information gets to the core. 
and that pretty much encompasses everywhere that the data is going. Now, what I will have to admit is that probably what's going to happen is you're going to create a data flow diagram similar to what we ended up with there, uh, using giant sticky notes or pads of paper or whatever, and then you're going to turn that into a PowerPoint presentation. And so, you know, I was going to illustrate how it, you know, it was only going to take 20 minutes, but what I then realized is that, well, it took me a half hour just to get everything all set up and find the icons and that sort of thing. Um, it took me about 0.3 hours, uh, you know, after that. Um, but then I had a lot of meetings in between, and by the time I was done, it actually ended up taking an hour and 30 minutes to get that PowerPoint done. Um, having said that, I could probably do another PowerPoint presentation about a different process in uh, about, uh, what, 1.5 minus 0.8, in about 0.7 or 36 minutes. Um, everything we do at Infotex is tracked to every six minutes, a, a, a tenth of an hour. Uh, but anyway, so about 30 to 40 minutes is what it'll take per drawing to use this PowerPoint method. Once you have the drawing drawn, uh, we feel like, you know what I mean, Spending a day on getting good solid drawings that you can remember a year later is worth the time uh, because data flow diagramming is a it, it's more of a management awareness exercise uh, than it is anything. And so with that, I guess I'll turn control of this uh, over to Michael. Uh, don't just don't know where he is. Uh, Michael. Um, Michael. Great information as always. Thanks Dan, thanks Sophia, and thank you for joining us today.